Sif, or as I call him, Jojo, he was a first grader my first year as a school librarian. And now he is an honor student at the University of Texas at Austin. So thank you, Jojo, this means a lot. And Denise Augusto was one of my mentors in my doctoral program and Nicole is a librarian extraordinaire and a graduate of TW, TWU. Oh, hi, Amanda. <laughs> it's like an Austin reunion. Um, and hi, Kim. Kim is my former GA. And Alyssa is my current GA. Do we want to go ahead and get started, Sarah? Sure, go for it. OK, um, well, thank you for coming uh, to the Living Multiliteracies webinar series sponsored by the University of North Texas College of Information, Department of Information Science. I'm Dr. Jennifer Moore. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Information Science. I focus on a school librarian certification. And the presentation today is called Computational Thinking, Systematic Problem Solving in the School Library and Life in General. So before I start the presentation, just uh, as an advertisement, please join us for the International Association of School Librarianship 2021 annual conference. It uh, was originally supposed to be held in Denton, Texas last year, but for obvious reasons, it was postponed. And this year it's going to be held virtually. It's a fabulous conference. I have attended multiple times and we have, because it is in a virtual setting, it has become extremely affordable and you don't have to travel anywhere. Visit us for details at https iasl2021unt.edu. So first, welcome. Uh, this presentation is for current and future school librarians. It's for current teachers and actually it's for anyone with an interest in learning about computational thinking. Most of what we talk about will be about computational thinking in real life, but because this is a school librarian certification program, we are going to talk about it within the context of libraries and that can also be transferable to public libraries and academic libraries. So first, I do not mean <laughs> this gift to be uh, confrontational, but basically, do you have a problem? We all have problems. Uh, work, personal life, health, we've all experienced problems. And while I can't solve all your problems for you, I can help you, I can teach you critical thinking skills to help arrive at potential solutions. And that's what we're going to be covering today. So I've been teaching computational thinking since 2017. And one of my main assignments, my students have to pick a problem and they have to apply the computational thinking process to work through the problem. And the problem can be real, it can be imaginary, it can be fantastical. They don't have to reveal any personal information. And I just wanna show you a list of problems my students have worked through over the years. I cannot legally share their work uh, for um, FERPA reasons, but some of the problems, some are seen more often than others, organizing a craft room, a closet, kitchen, that problem comes up a lot. Training for a half marathon, I'm impressed with how often that one has come up. Choosing a pet, uh, usually it's the child wants one and another child wants another. One year, one of my students arrived at a solution to create a hybrid pet by splicing DNA. That was actually really interesting. Um, some of my teachers and librarians use this process to teach uh, persuasive writing, poetry, uh, math. For planning vacations, that's a popular one. When one person wants to go to Hawaii and the other person wants to go to Colorado. For buying a home. One of my students actually emailed me 
when the um, assignment opened and said, hey, our lawnmower just broke. We fixed the lawnmower. <laughs> Uh, for building garden spaces, uh, for starting a new colony, exploring simple machines, plus many more. These are just the ones I remember off the top of my head. So real quick, the objectives for today's presentation. You'll be able to define computational thinking and its components. You'll get to see examples of problem solving in K through 12 and life outside the library and classroom. Recognize the benefits of teaching CT and then some of you know I love GIFs, so I entertain myself with GIFs in my presentations. So first, uh, raise your hand if you've ever heard of computational thinking. And I don't know, I can't see, there we go. Good answer, Kim. <laughs> okay, um, well, for those of you who do not raise your hand, you are definitely not alone. Uh, there are multiple definitions depending on the entity writing it. We're going to look at a few. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to read all this text. I just want to show you. These are four prominent ones I've been working with for years. The first one is Jeanette Wing. She's a, a former um, employee of Microsoft. And then we all know Google, they have their own definition. ISTE, the information, no, the International Society for Technology and Education has their own definition. And then the American Library Association's Office of Information Technology Policy has their own definition as well. So you're working with Microsoft, you're working with Google, you're working with uh, technology and education, and then you're working with a library centric organization. But if you look at the commonalities, we all have process, problems, we see solutions and solving, we see ordering, we see analyzing data. Um, and then what we see in the last three definitions across all disciplines, we see relationships between school and life outside, generalizing and transferring, creating connections. So I created my own definition. In a nutshell, basically computational thinking or CT, it involves an ordered or a systematic problem solving process that is transferable from computer science, which that's its foundation, and K through 12 education into other facets of our lives, including college, career, and everyday life issues. So as I showed you some of those examples at the beginning, not all of those were coding or computer science, right? We saw teachers using CT to teach poetry and physics. We, we saw actual problems uh, in the house with a messy closet or uh, a broken lawnmower. So, how do you make a milkshake? The first example, I'm going to start kind of general and then get more specific. When I first started learning about computational thinking, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Some people catch on quickly, some people don't. I was one that I just couldn't get it. I read article after article after article. And the one where it finally clicked was explaining computational thinking within the context of making a milkshake. So if you think you have one recipe for vanilla and then you have a different recipe for a chocolate milkshake and then a different recipe for a strawberry milkshake, well, using computational thinking, you're able to simplify this concept of a milkshake are making a milkshake into one recipe for vanilla, followed by a few sentences of adaptations needed to make other flavors. So that way, if you want a peanut butter milkshake, you don't necessarily have to have a specific restaurant or recipe rather, you have the, the vanilla and then you add, you, you uh, basically use the base for vanilla and then make a few tweaks for the peanut butter. And I have another example. I don't know, anybody raise your hand if you have one of these Better Homes and Gardens cookbooks. I've had this since uh, I was 19. You can tell it's kind of worn, 
but they demonstrate in this um, pizza recipe that here they have these are the ingredients you're going to need to make your pizza and this is how you do it oh but if you want a pan pizza instead of just the regular crust here's a few sentences on how to do it or if you want thin or calzone so they don't have to have a page for each and then of course they have um, varieties or variations on the dough so ct concepts i've shown you basically a broad overview of CT. Now we're going to get in kind of the nitty gritty definitions and then start to work through it. The first part with CT is you have your problem. As we've already mentioned, you start with the problem and you take that problem and you break it down into data processes or problems into smaller manageable parts. So when we're dealing with the problem, instead of looking at this huge thing, we break it into tiny problems, bite-sized chunks. You know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So instead of this overwhelming problem, break it into a bunch of different small problems. And then you look for patterns. Pattern recognition is observing patterns, trends, and regularities in the data. And then algorithm design, you develop after breaking it down and you find patterns, you use these patterns to develop step-by-step -step instructions for solving this and then similar problems, which leads us into abstraction where you identify general principles that generate the patterns. And then you focus on the important information, ignoring the relevant details. So like with the milkshake recipe, you're looking at the process and the general ingredients and not the specific, do you want vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, peanut butter? Some people switch these and that's fine. Um, some people start with abstraction and that leads to the algorithm design. I typically do algorithm first, but that doesn't make it right or wrong. That's just the way I do it. You'll also find at times you don't use all four concepts at once. You don't have to. That's really the nice thing about having such variety in CT is there's no wrong way. It's whatever way is right for you. And here's an illustration, if this will help, what, with, um, what decomposition would look like. You have your problem and you're breaking it into bits. And then you look for patterns within those bits. And then some people, like I said, go to abstraction. They take the specific and they make it generalizable. They take out all the little details and then you form um, a recipe, a set of instructions or vice versa. And this is from the BBC uh, Bite Size. I can get you the article if at some point you'd like to read it. I always provide citations. I'm not sure if this is going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah, there we go. Uh, did y'all hear that song, by the way, just out of curiosity? Yes, no, maybe? Not really. Oh, okay. <laughs> I tried. I'm sorry. It was the TikTok song, the oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. Basically great. Those of you in education, but I'm guessing this is in every field, you're used to another fad, right? There's something else we have to do. Ugh, I don't have time for what I'm doing as is. And the thing is, though, computational thinking has been around for a while um, and you're already doing most of it anyway. You just maybe haven't had a name for it. So those of you, I can tell you in teaching and librarianship, you've already been doing it. Um, I'm guessing in accounting or law, uh, you're doing that as well. You just maybe haven't called it computational thinking. In fact, a few of my students have reached out in the past and said, I've been doing this the whole time and I didn't know there was a word for it. In fact, I used it to diagnose myself medically and I was like, okay, I'm stepping back on that one. Like, I'm not gonna get involved in, in your health, but that's, that's really cool. Okay, so practice makes progress. Let's take a look. Walking through the process. So anybody familiar with Bob's Burgers? 
it's a cartoon on Fox that used to come on Sundays. It may still come on Sundays. Sweet. Some of you, yes. It's a, a husband and wife, Bob and Linda, and their three kids, uh, Tina, Jean, and Louise. And they own a burger restaurant. And Bob makes burgers with names that are all puns. It's, it's a comedy. So I use this as an example because I love food and I love the TV show. So the problem they have is dinner. What to make for dinner? Bob and Linda, they want hamburgers. And then Tina, Jean, and Louise, they want spaghetti and meatballs. Well, Bob wants to make sure everyone in the happy is friend or everyone in the family is happy. So how does he create a meal that will please everyone without having to make two meals? So that's our problem statement. First is decomposition, where he takes down the big problem and he breaks it down into smaller manageable parts. So he thinks, okay, hamburgers and spaghetti and meatballs. How do I make these together without having two meals? Let's look at ingredients and let's look at cooking techniques. So he's breaking the problem down. Can you give me a thumbs up if that's making sense so far? Cool. So then pattern recognition, where he, he broke down his problems, he's starting to do some research, and then he observes patterns, trends, regularities, and data. So in looking at these recipes, he sees hamburgers have, usually, not always, ground beef, hamburger bun, lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, onions, cheese, condiments, usually cooked on a grill or stovetop. Again, these are patterns, so they're generalities. And then with spaghetti and meatballs, what he sees, pasta, a marinara, meatballs, usually pork and beef, and then cheese, could be mozzarella and or parmesan, and then sometimes a garlic bread. And the cooking is often cooked on the stove top, partially, and then thrown into the oven. You with me so far? Cool. So next is algorithm, where you develop the step-by-step -step instructions for solving this and similar problems. So Bob writes a recipe. He does a meatball burger. So he's not quite doing a meatball because it's larger, but he's not quite doing a burger because he's using pork and garlic and oregano, maybe some basil. He cooks it on the grill like he would a hamburger. He puts it on toasted bun with um, butter and garlic. So he's imitating the garlic bread. He subs marinara for condiments. So no mayonnaise, mustard, ketchup here. He uses the fresh mozzarella instead of like cheddar or American. And then if you love pickles as much as I do, uh, you can't have a burger without pickles, cucumber pickles. So he used pepperoncini instead for that nice vinegar bite. You with me so far? Thumbs up. Excellent. So then there's abstraction. And that's where you take the general principles and you focus on the important information only. So you're no longer going to be looking at the little bitty details. You're taking the principles and applying them to similar problems, just like with the milkshake. So he's thinking, hey, if I can combine an Italian dinner that my kids like with the burgers my wife and I likes, what else can I do? Maybe I could do a Greek style burger. Again, these are not specifics, but if you think about the style of like a gyro, ground lamb, feta, red onions, tomato, tzatziki, and some type of a bread, or a Hawaiian style burger with spam and uh, grilled pineapple. And I mean, you never know, maybe one day Bob will open a restaurant and focus on really unique and flavorful burgers. <clears throat> so I know I've given you a lot of food examples because I do really like food, but a different approach. I had a, a person very close to me about a year ago she contacted me. Uh, she was not doing well um, in a really 
bad way, she needed some help with her house. Uh, she was feeling very overwhelmed and did not know what to do. She had just reached a point where she shut down. And this is an actual example of someone I know. And so she said, what do I do? I, I'm at a loss. And I said, okay, well, let's stop. Let's obviously it's an issue. It's a huge issue for you. But instead of thinking about the whole house being in the state it's in, let's first break it down into some smaller problems. Let's look at each room. You have the kitchen, the living room, the dining room, two bathrooms, three bedrooms, laundry rooms. So we're just going to look at one room at a time instead of a whole house. I said, okay, now let's talk about some of the issues in each room and let's look for some patterns. So she has a couple litter boxes. She has dishes in every room. She had dead plants in most rooms. She had dirty laundry in a couple rooms. So we began to see these patterns throughout the house. Now, dirty laundry wasn't in every room. She didn't have a litter box in every room, but these were just the general patterns. From there, we made a plan and we took baby steps. So we started with the most important. I said, litter box, obviously, fix it. Just do that today, 10 minutes, you'll be done. Tomorrow, what's next? She said, dead plants. Okay, so tomorrow for 20 minutes, you clean up the dead plants in each room. And little by little each day, using this algorithm, step by step, baby steps, she was able to get her house into a, uh, a much better place for her to be. And then we were talking and she said, what is this thing called? And I said, it's called computational thinking. And so then she had to read all about it. And then she said, wow, you know, this is interesting. I, I think I can use it for outside because it happens that her outdoor area is rather large and um, needed to be uh, groomed a bit. And so she started generating ways to apply this to outside as well. So that's real life. And just take a moment, all of you. So basically, so what does this have to do with you or your job or just why? Okay, so the big thing we're gonna think about because we're thinking about computational thinking outside the context of computer science is we're preparing our K through 12 or college students for um, a workforce that doesn't exist yet. And this data is from the World Economic Forum, the future of jobs. Uh, in 2005, the top 10 skills, you can see complex problem solving, critical thinking, the ones that are crossed out are no longer on the list, creativity. And then you look at the top 10 skills in 2020 that were needed, complex problem solving is still there. Critical thinking has moved up. Creativity, decision-making, um, cognitive flexibility. So as you can see, these skills are not going anywhere and critical thinking is becoming even more important, not just in K through 12, but in almost all aspects of our lives. So we may not be preparing our students for computer science, or maybe we are, it just depends on the student, but we are granting or giving them um, the cognitive flexibility to take on any problem that is thrown their way. Okay, so for those of you that are in the classroom or school library, also why, what does this have to do with the library? What does it have to do with the classroom? And what does it even look like? So school libraries. A school library is the largest inclusive classroom on campus. And a school librarian, one of the, the most amazing parts about being a school librarian is you get to interact with every student on campus. Feasibly, you should be. You're not limited to just your 20, 25, 30, 35 students or your 136 students. You get to interact with every student potentially. Library programming. 
you know, you get to kind of think outside of the box. Yes, you have to work in accordance with standards. And yes, you need to collaborate using, in Texas, we use the TEKS or the Common Core Standards. But you also get to kind of play outside, color outside the lines, doing innovative, customized, informal, and formal learning spaces. So you can do formal maker spaces, you can do informal maker spaces, you, you just have a variety of um, skills, you have a, a variety of abilities, and you're improving access to skill development and resources for all learners. So you're able to appeal to a potentially larger audience. Uh, you should be teaching tech skills and information literacy skills. But we're not going to forget about the you know, text based literacy, visual literacy by any means at all. And then you have an opportunity, you're preparing students for their educational careers, whether they're in kindergarten or 12th grade, their professional careers, and then everyday life issues. You, you have a lot of power as a librarian. You should use it passionately and wisely. So for student participation and engagement, you can teach students the CT process within the library setting and potentially offer a less intimidating environment. Yeah, you are preparing them for testing. You are collecting data, but also you, you create an environment that is potentially different from the classroom. And I am not by any means saying classroom teachers have an intimidating uh, classroom environment at all. It's just different, right? And then you're also uh, providing the opportunity to practice the process in a collaborative manner. Uh, innovative learning, CT within the library, you can put it in STEM and STEAM activities, coding. Um, if How many of y'all participate in um, the Hour of Code? Anybody? Or Computer Science Education Week? Excellent. And PBL, project-based learning, and then access and freedom. A lot of libraries, they house the manipulatives. Um, so whereas the first grade team, each teacher maybe can't have the math manipulatives, the librarian can have one set that they lend out, but then they can also use with within the library when not in use by first grade. And then CT is um, collaborative and hands-on. So it's not just like what you're going through now, which is me talking to you about it, but you can incorporate non-tech and tech elements. It's CT, we associate it with coding, but it doesn't have to involve coding. It can be any type of problem solving. Um, one of my students said to use, uh, she uses it with novels and stories to develop questions for identifiable problems that are relatable to the students. Collaborating with teachers as librarians, your instructional partners. That means what what does it mean to be an instructional partner? Anybody? You can type it in chat. It's okay. It's not a test. Anybody? Yes, excellent. So you co-teach, you co-plan, and you co-assess. Thank you, Jennifer. For, um, yes, thank you, Andrea, working collaboratively as an instructional partner. You're providing opportunities to develop ways their tech skills can reach others at a communication level or an assistive way. Incorporating STEM and code that provides CT thinking application. A lot of my students do use CT when teaching Hour of Code, when teaching um, STEM, whether it be in conjunction with a science teacher or um, through makerspaces. And then on a makerspaces, there are so many ways to use CT in makerspaces. I mean, it just, as we know, there's so many different ways to plan and implement makerspaces. So, I know you're all being hit with this at once. Do any of you have ideas for how to use the CT process or components of CT process in the library or the classroom or even in your lives? Good, Jennifer, yes. And I don't have a list of right answers. I'm genuinely am interested in what 
you have to say. So Jennifer says, encourage teachers to use for math word problems. Gretchen says, evaluating information sources. Susanna says goal setting, definitely use it for goal setting because think about how many goals like running a marathon is just so overwhelming, right? Yes, Andrea, breaking problems into smaller parts to get work done. Otherwise, it becomes overwhelming. Exactly. Exactly. Melody says the weeding process. Anybody that's had to weed a library knows exactly what Melody's talking about. Joseph says building empathy. That's that's a really good one, Jojo. Um, because you're dealing with a rather large problem, getting people to understand and relate and appreciate the experiences of others. Gretchen says time management. Yes, most most definitely. I think that's something I could I could work on. Good. Student research projects. Absolutely, Andrea. I mean, y'all remember back, some of you were my age, some, a lot of you younger, when you'd have that six weeks research unit, how massive that was, right? Turn in a 10 page paper. These days, hopefully doing things a little bit differently, but it's still a huge undertaking and this makes it more palatable for students or even us in academia or in grad school. Thank you all. So this is not, I mean, this presentation, obviously computational thinking uh, is important to me. I've done a lot of research in it, but my students have spoken highly of it as well. Some of my former students, uh, one of my former students, Amy W. I know reading off um, PowerPoint in large chunks is not best practices, but for accessibility purposes. Uh, my former student, Amy, said, I am very fortunate to be at a school where my library received a Makerspace grant this year. The implementation of Makerspaces has given me a wonderful opportunity to use computational thinking in my lessons. Each month, I do a Makerspace lesson with every class. The students are divided into groups and are given a problem that they must work collaboratively to solve. I tie each problem with a book that is read before the lesson before introducing the problem they will be working on. In each scenario, the students work collaboratively using the CT model in order to solve the given problem. It has been amazing to see the growth that the students have made in less than a year. They are more confident in their work and eager to take on new challenges. And this was not me requiring student feedback and assignments. This was Amy. She uh, wrote an article with me and I approached her and I said, only if you're actually doing this. And, and she was, and this was her input. <clears throat> Another one of my students, Erin B. She also wrote an article with me. She's a librarian uh, down in the Austin area. She says CT can connect with so many different content areas and as a result, it can be approached in lots of different ways. When students were first exploring the steps of, a comp of computational thinking, we applied it to jigsaw puzzles that they were working on. At times, we specifically name the steps and talk about how abstraction or pattern recognition can help us in a certain situation. The steps are posted on a chart that students can refer to during their time in the library. At other times, as we are preparing to begin an assignment, I can ask them, how can we use decomposition to help us out here? If students are truly going to learn and apply CT, they need to be able, or they need to be applying it regularly. It is almost like learning a new language. You have to hear it and use it to make it stick. One of my favorite things that came out of our introductory lessons this year was hearing students make connections about how CT can help them in their lives. So remember, remember this goes beyond coding. I asked them to add their ideas to a chart and it was amazing to see their thinking. One group realized that they could use the steps to approach a big project that was coming up in math and science. 
Another connected it to playing video games. And another student shared that he could use CT to improve at his free throws in basketball. It is really a natural process. And once students, once students learn about it and practice with it, the opportunities to apply are endless. So these are her students. Um, I want to say they were late elementary students that she was talking about. Um, are integrating CT into their studies and their lives. She's not coaching them. They're coming up with this on their own. They see a benefit, a value. So another thing for all you librarians and teachers out there is back in 2017, um, ESBEC, State Board of Educator Certification, um, basically um, is requiring new teachers to be evaluated um, in digital literacy and uh, has partnered with um, ISTE. The ISTE standards for educators and the ISTE standards for educators actually mention computational thinking twice. So we're seeing a partnership between ESBEC and ISTE. So all you Texas teachers, just know that the new teachers going through educator preparation programs are now being tested um, on their uh, ability to teach in a digital environment. So that's just an aside because, you know, we all love our standardized testing and data. It's the way of life in K through 12. So I'm going to share with you some resources uh, that I, I hope you enjoy a little bit of context. You can see this is Libraries Ready to Code, an initiative of the American Library Association. Uh, several years ago, I was introduced to CT because of Libraries Ready to Code. It was a partnership between Google and ALA uh, to basically teach K through 12 and public or and youth in general, basically through school libraries and public libraries uh, to teach them coding and computer science through CT, but then it became uh, much more broad. So it wasn't just about computer science and coding. It, um, you know, think about art, you think about music. So there's a website and let me see if it'll pop up. Can y'all see that? I lost my chat box. Thumbs up if you can see it. Cool. So it has your basic information about what is CT? Why are we even doing this? Case studies, infographic about the project. But then if you were like me and you needed more than, you know, an hour long presentation, to learn about it, in addition to some basic um, information, it talks about CT within library services. It offers resources and building your knowledge, which I'll get to in a second. So you can get started now. Everything is um, divided up by level or topic. Excellent filters on this website. So if you're getting started, you've had practice, you're experienced, you go to the resource results, beginner for facilitator, but then they also have your learners. So are you working with college students in a coding class that have a lot of experience with CT? Um, you can look it up through the RTC pathway connection. That's something specific to uh, the ready to code. Your audience, who are you working with? And we already said learner, facilitator type, the type of library, and then topics. Do you wanna talk about coding or do you wanna talk about ELA, gaming, um, story time, visual art? So again, it's not all coding. Yeah, coding is definitely an option or careers. Do you want this to be a one-time lesson? Do you want this to be an after school program? Do you want this to be a, a month long? Do you want to spend money? No money? Yes tech, no tech? And then what kind of resources do you have? So as you can see, the, the filtering ability is, is phenomenal. 
and then you can also just look it up by topic if you don't want to work with all the specific <clears throat> filters. So if you want to look at learning standards, these are specific to learning standards, software and app strategies, tutorials, and then for you, if you want more information on incorporating CT and um, possibly coding into your library program or your classroom, uh, there are th uh, five pathways. Broadening participation, connecting youth and emphasizing voice, engaging community, demonstrating impact and engaging families. So it's basically ala.org tools ready to code but just use your favorite search engine and type in ala ready to code okay so i tend to talk quickly and it looks like i did um and i don't like i said have my chat so i oh yeah, here we go um so do you feel like Maybe, maybe you could use at least some semblance of this to solve a problem or possibly, obviously not world peace, but excellent. Thank you. And like I said, you don't have to apply the whole thing. Um, you know, maybe sometimes you just need decomposition. Maybe sometimes you just need pattern recognition. So here's another plug for IASL and I'll take questions in just a second if you have them. Um, for the International Association of School Librarianship Conference, it's broadcasted virtually from Denton, Texas where I currently am this summer. It was originally supposed to be um, in person here in Denton last summer, but for obvious reasons, it was postponed. And now we're holding it virtually. It's not just for librarians um, and the price is extremely affordable. And uh, Dr. Kwan, she is with us today. Her husband did the uh, um, icon, he's quite talented. So this is before my references, my concluding slide, go me green. And this is uh, actually, I love Bob's Burgers so much. Not only do I have um, a coloring book and socks, but I also have the official cookbook. <laughs> it's a sweet home avocado burger. Uh, the entire cookbook is basically a play, a pun or puns. So uh, questions, do you have questions about CT? I'll do the best I can. I probably can't solve your problems for you, but. And if you think of them later, of course, if you're like me, maybe you don't feel comfortable asking in public and that is fine. You are always welcome to email me, jennifer.moore at unt.edu. You can ask me questions um, about applying it, um, how to work through uh, problems, how to teach it, bounce ideas, uh, and thank you, Jenna. Yes, it is hilarious show. Amanda, um, it was my student and I'll be honest, yes, she did. That was her project. She was like, my husband and I just used it to fix the lawnmower. Can I use that for my project? Yeah, go for it if it works. Um, but I no longer have access to her work. I wish I did because that is one that really just stuck out is impressive because I to this day can't figure it out. I can barely put gas in the lawnmower, much less fix it. But I know they used YouTube and they looked at um, a diagram of the different parts of the lawnmower, but I don't even remember what was wrong with it. 
but also hello and congrats on graduating. Any other questions, comments, ideas? Denise, I, yes, definitely hungry. And thank you. Thank you, Denise, for, for coming. And uh, for those of you who didn't hear earlier, Denise was one of my mentors uh, when I was a doc student. She's a professor extraordinaire at um, Drexel. Thank you, everyone, Jojo, Spencer, Annika, Gretchen, thank you for your kind words. And again, if you have questions, thank you, Kim. Kim uh, knows a little bit about CT. She has taught with me. Thank you, Andrea, Karen, Susan, Karen. Thank you, Nicole. Melody, Stephanie, thank you. Jason, Amanda, um, I can, oh yeah, I could do that. Um, it's going to be on the MLL website, Amanda. And I, you know what? Give me a second. Let me, I can fix this right now. I can get you a link to the Google version. Because. I'll put a link to the Google version in the chat box. assuming it pops up. If not, there, here we go. Share. Okay, copy link. Done. My computer's running slowly, it must know. Everyone in meeting. There you go, there's a Google version if you're interested. Carla, thank you. Alyssa, thank you. I appreciate you coming. I know we're out 12 minutes early. Use that time for some ice cream or some tea, maybe some stretching, yoga. And then register for next Oh, you need, okay. Anyone with the link. Does that work now? Thank you for letting me know. Okay, excellent, thank you. But join us next month for April's webinar, uh, where Dr. Evans and Kwan are going to be talking about our master's degree program, which I highly recommend. It is outstanding. But thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording, Jennifer. Okay.